Hello, welcome back to my channel, or hey y'all, as I always start my videos. And uh, excuse me if, uh, excuse the, the video if you hear some lawn mowing in the background. There's some some people doing lawn work in, in the out, outside and I, I can't control that. Not, the whole world doesn't revolve around me and my channel, unfortunately. But uh, I, I have today here with me Mark Collette. I'm very, very excited. I've been on his channel. I've been on This Week in the Alt Right. I've, you know, we've done videos together, and I bought my husband his book for Christmas, and he read it and he liked it. And I have actually wanted to start up this conversation about the traditional male and that perspective because we talk about traditionalism in general and we talk about you know getting women into the movement or we talk about wi you know women rejecting feminism or we talk about uh, how women see themselves in society and even in the greater anti-feminist movement you have anti-traditionalist and in the the greater anti-feminist movement not all of them not all of them but i've i've had the benefit of working with uh, some people in the men's rights movement, and I have made friends, and and they've helped me out a lot with uh, previous videos and with previous activism. So I'm very very thankful, and I appreciate that. However, I see a tide turning towards very anti-traditionalist. A lot of uh, m traditional male voices are getting shut down when it's concerning men's rights. And I said to some of my friends, so this isn't something that I ha that I haven't said to people who are my friends that I disagree with. Um, I can't follow a movement that wouldn't allow my husband in, that wouldn't allow my children in. I have two boys. And when we talk about rejecting feminism, when we talk about embracing traditionalism, it's not just one-sided. It's not just how do women feel about it. It's about the fathers as well. I talk a lot about complementarianism and what that means and gender roles. And there is a male role. And it's time that we hear it. It's time that we hear the real, honest, raw, however uncomfortable it may be, um, however provocative it may be, it is time to unleash the truth about the male's perspective on traditionalism, the traditional male. So I'm very excited to get the conversation started with Mark Collette. And I just want first, if Mark can, and of course we probably all know Mark Collette, but if you could just uh, uh, do me a favor and run down who you are, what you're about, and um, kind of a little little brief bio, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Well, firstly, I just want to say thank you for having me on tonight. I obviously do a lot of work on my own channel, but it's, it's always really nice to be a guest, especially on a channel like your own. And I'm really, really happy to be here with you because over the last few months, over the last year, I've seen you develop as a person, as a YouTuber, and your work just keeps getting better and better. I saw you do the debate with... Um, the girl who calls herself pagan goddess. And it was absolutely phenomenal. I left a comment on it and I messaged you afterwards. I think you're a great advocate for traditionalism. And you don't just advocate traditionalism, but you live it, which is the important thing. You follow through with what you say. And I see so many people in this movement who are desperate to cling on to women who advocate traditionalism but don't necessarily live it, who get these kind of obsessions with certain women in the movement. But I've repeatedly said that women like yourself, women like Ayla, you should be the female role models or the female leaders in the movement because you are leading by example, by doing the most important thing a female can do, which is, of course, to be a mother, to be a homemaker, to homeschool your children. It's absolutely phenomenal. And that's why I'm so proud to be here tonight and happy to be taking part in this live stream. But a bit about me. 
For those who don't know me, I've been a nationalist since um, the turn of the century. I got involved with the British National Party in the year 2000. I've spent 18 years doing this. I released a book, I think it was last year, I released the book. Um, yeah, it was finished at the end of 2016, but I, I released it at the beginning of last year. It's called The Fall of Western Man. That's really sort of my philosophy on the way that we as a people have fallen, the way that we as a people have had our institutions like family, which is, of course, the bedrock. It's what underpins our society. It's the cornerstone of our society, of our community, of our nations, of our whole civilization. And that's been broken down by our enemies. And the way to rebuild that, the way to enshrine it, is to get back to traditionalism. And that's something that I believe in. Now, obviously, People can follow me on Twitter, they can follow me on Gab, they can follow me on YouTube. I do a weekly show called This Week on the Old Right. Lacey's been a guest on that a number of times. And I also do a weekly podcast. And this week's podcast will be out tomorrow. And it's on the potential casting of a black man as James Bond. So I'm not going to say anything more about that because... This show isn't about that, but I'll be saying a lot about that tomorrow over on my channel. So if you all haven't subbed, go and sub and make sure you hit that little bell as well. Because I get so many people telling me, oh, I didn't even know your show was on. I didn't even know your podcast had come out. Oh, I don't get to see your stuff anymore because YouTube doesn't notify me. So make sure you go over there, subscribe and hit that bell so you get the reminders. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for um for that introduction and i i took a look also at your book uh the fall of western man uh definitely some great great stuff in there and we actually if you can buy the book i know that you you have it for download for free uh which is very very generous but um i did buy the book so if you can buy the book and support mark collette i would really appreciate it i'm sure you would really appreciate it as well so, yeah, thank you for buying it and thank you for your kind words. I mean, I, I put it up for free. So if you do like it and you do buy it and you want more people to read it, it does have an open license for you to reproduce it yourself, not for profit. So you can even print copies if you want, as long as you don't sell them for profit. But then again, you know, if you do and if you sell 10 million of them, well, you know, good luck to you, mate. Good luck. <laughs> but yeah, download it, send it to all your friends, family. It is available for free and you can buy it in hardback and paperback. But thank you for your kind words and thank you for purchasing a copy for your husband. I'm really, really touched that both of you enjoyed it. Well, thank you for writing it. So uh, we are going to start off with probably the most, the most uh, uncomfortable question. And that is, no, I'm not flirting with you. I'm taken. <laughs> but uh, do you, are you married? Do you have a girlfriend? Are you in a committed relationship? This matters because we're going to be touching on relationship stuff. So uh, where is that in, in life for you? I'm not married. Um, that's no big secret, but I am not commenting on my relationship status. I never comment on that publicly. That is something that I, I always keep very private, whether I'm in a relationship or whether I'm not. Um, the reason being, and it's quite simple, is obviously as I become more high profile, if I am or I'm not with someone, I don't like that to be dragged into the public sphere. That would all change if I married somebody or um, had a child with somebody, obviously. But in the past, the reason I don't make this public is quite simple. The way people make things public today is through Facebook. And many people play out their relationships rather publicly on social networks. Now, obviously, I have dated people before. People have seen um, some of the girls I've dated because sometimes people demand being connected to you on Facebook. They demand, you know, sharing their life in that way with you. And that, to me, has always been a source of embarrassment because it does get played out. Your whole life gets played out like a soap opera. And that's something I don't like. And I've noticed that even though you're married, your posts and your social network output is always um, very befitting of somebody who is a traditionalist. And really, um, that's why I keep things rather close to my chest. And also, I don't really want to, you know, if I am with somebody or if I'm not with somebody, I, I never like to... Uh, 
really put them in the limelight, to put them under the spotlight, because that can be uncomfortable for people, especially with the nature of what I do. That makes a lot of sense, actually, and I, I respect that. I'm not TMZ, <laughs> but um, no, I I actually on on my Instagram and in my public Facebook page, I might post something that I, I think it's important to kind of put it out there that I am married because you know, woman, you know, and I I want to claim that because I. I don't want to be accused of something that I'm trying not to do. And I also don't want to invite something that, that I don't want. So I want people to know that I'm married, but the way that I would express that maybe on social media is, uh, maybe sharing a picture that conceals my husband's identity. And definitely he has his, his identity has to be concealed. It has to be safe. Um, but he's not a social media guy. I mean, he, he could do without it. And, um, and he, he actually really hates his picture being taken. Um, he, so he, he's kind of, uh, he's not very, he wouldn't want to be public anyway. But you, that's need just, that's just husband, like, you need to say you've got a husband. You need to say you've got a husband. Definitely. Because if you did it, with all the nice pictures of food that you cook, there'd be like a queue round the block of <laughs> eager men coming round wanting their tea cooked for them. Because I've noticed your social media sort of heavily focuses on your sort of wonderful culinary creations, which again is something I'm I really like about what you do. You know, a lot of these women who put up social media posts, it's all kind of like. Oh, look at me in my bikini. Look at me with my glass of champagne. Look at me in a provocative pose. But your social media is more like, look at the wonderful food I've just cooked for my husband and my children. Look at how well I keep my house. I think things like that are very endearing. And I've said before, women are emotional creatures. Women are very different to men. And that's a necessity because men and women form complementary pairs. And men kind of cover women in one way and women cover men in the other. So we both take care of different roles. But women are becoming increasingly unhappy as they pursue the path of promiscuity, of feminism, of careers. And I think it's so important for homemakers, traditionalists and family women to show that the home is a happy place, that the home is somewhere that can be fulfilling, it can be happy, it can be a place where a woman gets everything she needs. Because the further women stray from the home, the further they stray from a family, the further they stray from marriage, the unhappier they get. And it's about time we started making family, home, cooking, food, being a homemaker, being a mother, being a wife. We need to make that popular and we need to show people it's a happy place. Because all these Instagram posts showing girls in their bikinis surrounded by men drinking champagne. That doesn't lead to a happy place. It leads to burnt out, used up women who are in their 30s and 40s, who aren't married, don't have children, run out of time, and are then deeply bitter and resentful because they can't have children and can't pursue the natural goals which nature has always pushed us to pursue and nature knows will make us happy. But our enemies try to push to one side to promote unnatural causes, which ultimately lead to our racial ruination and our ruination as individuals. Definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for your encouraging words and your, your support, really. Thank you so much. Um, but this is about you. <laughs> no, but I, re I really like the... the uh, the perspective of, you know, the traditional male on the traditional woman. So, uh, I'm just going to change things up here. This is, I'm just going to go with the flow of, of what, what you've been saying. And, and I have my list of questions, but you know, my type A personality can wait for just a minute. Uh, so you were talking about the, the, uh, the role of a woman and the role of the traditional woman and and 
the female sphere? What would we consider the traditional female sphere? You know, home, uh, hearth, and and taking care of husband and, and children. What do you look for in your current and or eventual <laughs> partner? What What is that partner look like for you? Well, I look for someone who's looking for a provider, someone who's looking for a protector, someone who is looking for obviously a lover and a friend. I believe that in a partner, it's kind of like, almost like the Triforce of perfection. <laughs> People who play Nintendo games will get that reference. And you have to have a mental compatibility, a physical compatibility, and a spiritual compatibility. You have to be able to get on like friends. You have to be able to find each other, obviously sexually attractive. There has to be a spark there. And finally, you have to be spiritually compatible. And by that, I mean, maybe in a religious way, or maybe just being comfortable around each other. Sometimes you can get on with somebody really well. Sometimes you can find somebody very sexually attractive, but you're just not quite comfortable with each other. It's that little bit of extra that allows you to sit there together, watching a movie, and just being really comfortable being next to each other, and just not wanting to be anywhere else, knowing that person's the right person. And when you've got all those three things, you are with the right person. You do need those three things to be happy. However, what do I look for in a woman? Well, I look for somebody who's attractive. I mean, I'm not going to fudge the issue. Um, I don't find obesity attractive. I don't find women who are unkempt attractive. I don't find women who can't dress themselves or apply their makeup or do their hair properly attractive. I like an athletic. I like um, obviously an athletic woman. I like somebody who keeps in shape. You know, I would like to take my partner to the gym, go on runs with her, go hiking with her. Things like that are really, really important to me. So she's got to be in good shape, have good presentational skills, but she's also got to be traditional. Now, I know that even with traditional women, before women get married, they often have some form of job. They often do something. But I think a woman has to be doing that with the intention of one day giving that up to join a partner and to be a homemaker. So she has to be a traditionalist. She has to see eye to eye with me on politics. And it's very, very important this is because I have these things and I call them lifestyle divides. And lifestyle divides are reasons not to be with somebody. Now, a reason not to be with somebody isn't something minor. It's not something like, well, I prefer peas. I prefer garden peas and she prefers green beans. It can never work. That's ridiculous nitpicking. But if you're with someone who thinks fitness is a complete joke and wants to sit on the sofa shoving Pringles and popcorn into a gob as she watches soap operas, and you want to be out hiking, finding a country pub and having a nice, healthy sort of steak after you've done it, that's all sort of a naturally grown, hand-reared steak, and she sits on the couch eating Pringles. Yeah, it's not going to work. You need to find people, or you need to find someone who has really common goals and a common outlook on life. And as I said, you'll never find somebody who's identical to you. I'm not saying you're looking for a clone of yourself in female form, but you are looking for someone that you don't have these big lifestyle divides. But most of all, the person you find, the person you end up with, they have to have an outlook where they want children. They have to prioritize wanting children. I would never be with somebody who turned around to me and says, it's not on my priority list. It, it doesn't matter to me. It's I do or I don't, you know, I'll be just as happy because a lot of these people, they say, oh, they'll be just as happy without children. And when they hit that wall, that's it. They're done. And most importantly, with a woman, she has to be feminine. She has to play the female role because men and women are complementary pairs. And I am someone who very much likes to take charge. I'm someone who you know, wants to take the natural role of being a provider, being a protector, being a disciplinarian and being the head of the house. I don't want someone who is going to have this feminist outlook where she thinks rather than being my partner, she needs to compete against me. She needs to battle against me on every little issue to try and take part in some futile war of the sexes. Because I can assure you, 
that does not end well for either partner or for the relationship as a whole. I had a hard time unmuting myself. <laughs> no, I, I really like that explanation. And I, I love that you're so honest. And these are the things that that unfortunately get kind of drowned out. I was talking to, you know, in the the general anti-feminist sphere in these in these subjects, I was actually talking to my husband after a very black pilling couple of days of just getting having conversations about men's rights and having conversations in that sphere and being told, oh, you only want your husband for a paycheck. You only want your husband um, for a shield. And I kind of took it personally. And it was, it was a, you know, it was a, I felt like it was an attack on myself. I felt like it was an attack on my husband. I felt like it was an attack on my family. And I had to kind of grow up a little bit, sit with it for a, a while, um, and really see the logic behind what people were saying rather than react emotionally. And I finally got to that point in the process of being red pilled on feminism. But adamantly, I, I, we got to a point where I could see logically what they were saying and I still disagreed emotionally. And so I went to my husband and I would ask him sincerely, not in an interrogating way, but I would ask him, do you feel oppressed or taken advantage of? Do you feel like I'm only out for your, your paycheck? Do you feel like I'm only out, you know, for this, the protection that you provide? Um, how do you feel? about our roles do you feel taken advantage of and this was i actually asked him several times and each time he laughed he laughed because it was so ridiculous to him he said lacy when i go to work and people i tell people um what you cook and i describe kind of the food that you make and i kind of describe what you do and and how you take care of the children and i talk nicely about my wife other people are jealous and other people say oh you've got a great thing and this is no compliment on me this is this actually makes me very very uncomfortable but he even says you know i'll show pictures and 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 then the other guys will say whoa how'd you get her and i'll be like you're lying um you know so it, it's but the idea that there there's so many men who he he would go to work and his co-workers you know, are in bad marriages and they're unhappy. They don't want to go home because their wife is not pleasant to be around or they're divorced or they just go from work to the bar and he will come home and tell me this stuff. And he says, I am very blessed. And I feel the same way about him. I'm very blessed to have him. And so his reaction of just kind of laughing about this, this idea that I'm taking advantage of him um, it, it was just completely ludicrous to him. So as you think of kind of be, being a father uh, and being a husband and being the breadwinner and taking on that role of protecting and providing, how would you look at it? Would you look at, you know, is it situational? Does it depend on, you know, if she if she's playing her role as well? Would you feel taken advantage of? That all depends. And you've really given the, you've really kind of answered my question with what you said at the end. You see, I do believe men should be the provider, the protector, and the breadwinner. However, there is a large caveat to that. Now, firstly, if you are just married, if you are just a married couple, or if you're just dating, or you just live together, and there are no children involved, I don't see any problem in a woman going out to work. Now, my mother, she worked, and then as soon as she fell pregnant, that was the end of it, and she never went back to work again. And generally speaking, that's how most women in Britain behaved. Women would often be involved in some form of um, industry. They'd either be, or they might work in some kind of service industry, like hairdressers, beauticians. They did a range of different jobs. But when they got married, then they had children. That is when they went into the home 
and they would become a housewife, a homemaker, and it would be a full-time job bringing up the children. Now, the caveat to all that is how your woman treats you. And this is the problem with the modern world. Now, I believe that if I'm paying for everything, if I'm going out there and I'm being the breadwinner, if I'm going out there and I'm being the provider, the hunter-gatherer, coming home every night with the, uh, the steaks over my back, you know, so she can put them on the stove and the children are running around and everything's happy, that's perfect. Now, if on the other hand, you are going out to work and you are bringing home the bacon for your wife or your girlfriend to be going out and literally living a non-trad life with your money, that's where the problem occurs. And I've seen this before. I've seen men who are quite well-to-do, have got quite a bit of money, and a woman comes up to them and she's like, you know what, I've always wanted a traditional life. I've always wanted to live like a housewife. I've always wanted to be the stay-at-home woman. But what she means by the stay-at-home woman is basically she wants to be out shopping, drinking with her friends, and living almost a perpetual party life with your money. And that's not how it works. Again, it's complementary pairs. The man, he goes out to work and he's a provider, but the woman provides in another way. She cooks, she cleans, she looks after the children. And being a housewife and looking after children is a full-time job. Tending to small children or newborns is a full-time job. It's wearing, it's exhausting. There are very long days. You're often up during the night. And on top of all of that, there's the shopping, there's the management of the home, there's the cooking, there's the cleaning, there's the washing, there's the getting the kids ready, reading to them. All of these things takes extreme management and extreme time. And that's where the playoff comes. Whilst the husband's out working, whilst he's out earning money, whilst he's out being the hunter-gatherer, the woman has to play her role in the home. And if a man who is a traditionalist does get suckered into a situation where he's essentially paying for a woman that he doesn't have kids with to stay at home, and stay at home means drinking bottles of wine and going out shopping with her friend, you need to put an end to that because that's one of these kind of great double standards that some of these women want. And I've actually experienced these women myself they believe that they should get everything handed to, a, to them on a plate by men. They believe that traditionalism should provide for them in that way. But then they themselves, when they have that support, when they're getting that money, when they're getting that lifestyle, they don't reciprocate by acting like a traditional woman. They simply act as if they're on sort of 24-7 holiday, but with the man's money. And that is where there can be a conflict or a double standard. And if men bear that in mind and act accordingly, you won't go far wrong. Definitely. I agree with that. And and I actually talk a lot of, on my channel about the woman's role in the community. And homemaking is more than just staying in the home. Because uh, I think that it's certainly in our in our times in our modern times that's extremely isolating and not healthy but traditionally women together would go raise communities volunteer um you, you know actually do community work and i think that's something that's been lost over over the decades and and certainly you know you can go further back and and see the breakdown of the community but uh my myself i love to be in the in the community and and working with other women and kind of doing work that way as well so so it's um you know homemaking is is more than just definitely if you're if you're sitting at home and watching soap operas and bomb eating bonbons then that's not traditional <laughs> so okay so Let's get to some of the laws. I just want to just want to add something you said there. I, I once knew a guy, and he was um, he was actually a really nice guy, but he had low self esteem, and he married a, a fat slob. She was an absolute slob, 
And he was going out. He actually had a good job. He was a very intelligent guy, despite his low self-esteem. And he was going out there earning good money. And his wife was meant to be the homemaker. She was meant to be the person who looked after their child. And, you know, they had a second child and she was meant to be doing that. And she literally used her time to sit on her fat ass doing nothing all day. So he would go out, make the money, come home. And she'd be like, oh, I'm exhausted. Oh, are you going to start looking after the kids? It's time you pulled your weight. So he'd come in, then take over from the children. And she'd have just spent her whole day on the phone watching TV. And he'd have to tidy up the house when he got in. Now, that is absolutely cooked. And that's where a woman is playing both roles. On one hand, she's taking the positives of being a traditionalist, then taking the positives, so to speak, of being a feminist and having sort of, you know, both, you know, having it all her way. And that's just a little anecdote. Don't get yourself in that situation. If you are out working all day and you are bringing home the crust and you come home and the woman who sat at home has been sat doing nothing and then you have to start doing the housework when you get in, you start having to do all that. There's something deeply wrong there. And that's why I'm talking about being a complementary pair because your wife doesn't come to work and do your work for you. You don't sit with your feet up on your desk while she does the spreadsheets or operates the machinery. Equally, you know, you don't expect to go home and start mopping the floor and putting a wash on when she's been sat all day watching Oprah or Jerry Springer. And that's a very important thing to remember. But sorry for butting in. I, I look forward to the next question. Actually, um, on on that point, I I've gotten a lot of flack from some quote traditionalist, um, even in, you know, in these Facebook groups, these these mom groups who who think that they're, you know, just because they stay at home that they're traditional. Uh, that's why. That's one of the reasons uh, I made my own homemaking group and it's politically driven. So you have to be anti-feminist and it's nationalist leaning as well. But uh, it, when just the idea of thinking of my husband coming home and, and saying you have to take over the kids now, that is, that is such a disrespect to what, the man is doing your husband. I mean, the father of your children, the one who provides for your, your life. And it, it's such disrespect. And I firmly believe that his job is going to an office. And I'm so glad that not, not in a, a mean way, like, <laughs> um, like I would, wouldn't do it if I didn't have to, but, or, or if I had to, but I am so glad that I don't have to deal with office politics because I would be fired so quick. And the, the fact that he goes and he does that and he has to retain himself or he has to work the office politics or, or he has to put himself in that position or, you know, there's been times where he's worked. I'm not exaggerating, not exaggerating here, 24 hours a day. That is no exaggeration. Uh, one night he, he came home from work and this was a few years back. He came home from work and he said, I've got more work to do. So he, he got on the computer and remotely did some work and I was kind of waiting on him to finish and we have a nightly routine where we kind of spend some time together. And then I fell asleep waiting on him. And then I woke up in the morning and he was still working. Now, a, a woman who isn't of good character would berate her man for that. Why don't you pay attention to me? Why don't you pay attention to me? Um, I was worried about him. I was worried about his health. I was worried about, you know, it, he needs sleep. And just like I don't, like you said, I don't go to his office and tell him what he needs to do with his job. My job is very specific. It's very 
lined out. Uh, we do have these very specific gender roles. And I think that that helps the household run very smoothly. And, and it just operates like a well-oiled machine. And when he comes home, you know, I, I'm still dealing with the kids. He's a great father. He's present. He's present in his, in his kids' lives. But I don't expect him to come home and pick up and fix dinner and, and pick up the mess that I've made and tend to the kids. Uh, you know, I, that is one of my biggest pet peeves. And you'll find that a lot around social media with uh, moms groups or women's groups. Oh, just, I could go on forever about that. No, I've, I, I know that and I've had that myself. I know that uh, some women are sort of quite selfish over things like that. And they don't understand that the man is actually doing his best to provide. He's doing his best to secure his job. He's doing his best to bring in money. But there is, again, a caveat to that. It is very important that both men and women keep their duties in healthy balance. Now, the man is the homemaker. He is expected to be out of the home more than the woman. But the man should never, ever dedicate himself to his job to the degree he misses out on time with his children. It is very important that children get to spend time with both their mum and their dad because they pick up different traits from their mum and their dad. And obviously, I'm not saying men should shirk their duties at work and the odd late night isn't a bad thing, but you should always make sure as a man that you can spend time with your children. And I've got friends who go out of their way to make sure they take their kids to the park, make sure they play with their children, make sure they're at the table every night in order to have dinner with their wife and kids. And I also know people who will work away all week and then be away, you know, playing golf on Sunday and a family day out is a rarity. And I think that equally can be taking things too far. It's about balance. It's about the man providing but also the man must never be a stranger in his own home. Definitely. And, and I will say that my husband in the past has worked uh, too much and he's even admitted this, you know, to himself and to me. And it took um, a little bit of time for, for him to balance that out. He was under a lot of pressure. He put himself under a lot of pressure. He even told me, you know, it's not, you that's putting pressure on me it was me that was he he was putting pressure on himself but he learned to kind of say no you know no i won't uh put my family through this and i won't put myself through this uh for for our health and and you know overall happiness so i mean but that was years back and you know he's never not been an amazing father and husband. He's he's always been an amazing father and husband. So I, he's he's definitely a great example of that. But um, a lot of people in the chat are asking about feminist policies, and I was wanting to take the direct that the chat in that direction. So when we talk about the traditional male, and and I'll get to some specific questions from the chat in just a minute, but. When we're talking about the traditional male who wants family, who wants marriage, we are living under feminism. We are living under these laws that, I mean, I in the debate with, with uh, Pagan Goddess and, and a couple of times since, I, I've mentioned specific laws that, that are in place because of feminism. You have the Violence Against Women Act, you have the Duluth model, you have, I mean, affirmative action. I mean, there's, there's so many things. Uh, do you feel like you are at a disadvantage? Do you feel like there is this, um, are you scared to kind of go into relationship or how do you think about that? Yeah, of course, there is. Um, I'm never scared of going in a relationship, but there is, of course, a situation now where men are clearly at a disadvantage 
in several different ways. Well, in many different ways. I'm not going to say, you know, this isn't going to be an exhaustive list because if I start talking about this, somebody's going to say, I left something out. So let me just uh, cover a few of them. The first is obviously marriage. Now, the state and our enemies, the internationalists, the people trying to destroy us, the uh, sneaky tribe that came up with feminism, they are always looking for ways to destroy the bedrock of our civilization, which actually, as we said, is of course the family unit. And one of the things they've done is popularize and make divorce absolutely acceptable. But they have also made it profitable for the woman. They have made it so if you divorce, a woman will always come out on top, which makes it so women are more likely to divorce their partner. And the problem with this is women are most of the time, for or the majority, in the majority of cases, they are the ones who initiate the divorce, which I'm sure you're well aware of. And because they are most likely to initiate, when you add to that, the likelihood that they will more often than not come out on top and make a profit from the divorce, it leaves men in an enviable situation. And it makes marriage very, very unattractive to men who have something in life or have a stake in life, which is very bad because you want to see lasting relationships. We want to see marriages. We want to see relationships that are that come about for the right reasons and people don't walk out of them for the wrong reasons now in my book i listed a few reasons why divorce should be acceptable things such as sustained abuse things such as a partner abusing a child in the marriage because obviously partners come together to raise a child and if one of those partners is a threat to those children divorce would be something logical if, say, a partner goes completely off the rails and becomes a drug addict or is spending all the family's money on gambling, divorce would again be acceptable. But in today's day and age, a couple can have a silly argument over what they're going to watch one night and that can spiral into her walking out of the house and two weeks later telling him she wants a divorce because all of her cowy friends have said she'll have more fun going out drinking with them and living the single life again. And because of the way the divorce court is set up, there are no disadvantages. In fact, there are many advantages to her taking the route of divorce. And that's a major, major problem. Now, one of the ways I would solve this is by stating that a couple, when they divorce or if they divorce, don't split things evenly, but they take with them what they brought with them on the day of the marriage plus half of what was generated after the marriage. And what I mean by that, if the guy comes in with a million pounds and the girl comes in with nothing and they are married for two weeks, she should not take half of that man's money. That would be absolutely absurd and unfair. However, if a man comes into a relationship with a million pounds and a woman comes in with nothing and five years later he now has two million pounds well she should go away with half of what they made as a couple but he should retain what he had before the relationship started so you take what you contributed to and what you came with but you don't have a claim to what you initially bought into because otherwise you have situations which occur now where men who are doing rather well for themselves attract a certain type of woman who then can lay claim to everything he built and achieved before they got together. And obviously that works the other way too. If there is a particularly talented or career minded woman who builds up an empire and she gets with a younger sort of more virile man, she wants a bit of a toy boy, Equally, he shouldn't be taking half of what she had in the first place. And I think if you went with that model, you would see a lot less divorces. Now, again, I can give you a personal anecdote. I know a guy, he's um, loosely connected to me, and he married a girl and everyone told him she was trouble. Everyone told him she was a bad egg. Everyone told him she was the wrong kind of girl. He married her. It was only a very, very short time after they'd been married. Her phone was blowing up all the time. 
he had a look at it. It's an iPhone. He saw what the messages were. They were somebody from her work flirting with her. He politely texts this person back saying, please do not send these kind of messages to my wife. I'm her husband. I would appreciate it if you left her alone. She went absolutely ballistic, said he embarrassed her, said that he had caused trouble for her at work, walked out and demanded a divorce. Now, they'd only been married, I believe, a matter of months at this point. And from that, she claimed half of the house. She claimed half of the car, half of everything he had, half of his other property. And she didn't really have claim to any of those things, but the divorce courts granted her it. And at the end of it, you had a broken man. So I would make divorce courts fairer and I would not grant these ridiculous quickie divorces from people who had just had a change of mind. And I would make it known that marriage is something for life. So people didn't take those vows as loosely and as flippantly as they do now. Secondly, of course, we also see the same problem when it comes to custody through the courts. Women get custody, men find it hard to get custody, and men are repeatedly shown sort of the thin end of the wedge by the police and by the authorities when it comes to custody. If a man's 10 minutes late, picking up or dropping off his child, it's a major infraction. Whereas on the other hand, if a woman fails to comply with the court and allow her ex-partner to see the children, it's at best a slap on the wrist. And again, this skews everything in the woman's favor and makes it very hard for men who want to be a dad to actually be a dad. And in my book, I talk about the importance of the father figure, the importance of strong male role models. So this not only harms the man, but it also has a disastrous effect on the children. Then the final thing I want to talk about um, before this turns into some kind of epic 40 minute rant is you are also now seeing another way that feminists have skewed things, and that is that women can never be wrong. So a woman cannot be challenged. So essentially, if a woman who I have never met decides to lay allegations of rape at my doorstep, I can now not say anything against that. And the feminists and the liberals and these soy boy cucks, they want to pass legislation which is not innocent until proven guilty, but guilty until proven innocent. So women are now assumed to be telling the truth, even if they are blatantly crying rape. And as we have seen in the courts recently, there are increasingly a number of women who go out, have a few drinks and act like, for want of a better word, sluts, they go and do things they shouldn't be doing. They go back with men. And the next day, their friends are like, oh, my God, I can't believe you did that. Did you really do that with him? And because they're embarrassed of what they've done, because they're embarrassed of the way they've behaved, because they're embarrassed, because they've just handed it out onto a plate and this guy probably doesn't want to see them again or it was just a bit of fun. They feel embarrassed. They feel vindictive. They feel angry and they cry rape. And this has happened to celebrities. This has happened to young men. And the police are buying into this feminist narrative of, well, if a woman says it, it must be true and we can't question it. And this really, really does affect men in a hugely negative way, puts them through absolute hell. And unfortunately, it can leave their life in tatters. Now, I actually, I don't know this person, but he's a friend of a friend. He was with a woman. He um, didn't really like her as much as she liked him. She'd come over, they'd have a bit of pizza, they'd have a bit of fun, you know, she'd stop over. But she wanted to take it further. And one night, she stayed over at his, and the next morning, she was pestering him. She wanted to go on holiday with him, she wanted him to commit. And he was just honest with her, he said, look, I don't want to go on holiday with her. And when she said, why not? He was quite honest. He just, I, I don't want to pursue a relationship like that with you at this current time. You know, we have a lot of fun together, but I don't want to get that deep with you. Fair enough. And she then went to the police. Later on, he got a knock on the door. The police charged him with rape. She claimed that he raped her. And shortly after that, it was in the papers. His life was ruined. He basically was very depressed, very anxious. He obviously thought everyone in the town believed these allegations. 
And the jury found him not guilty in about 25 minutes because it was all just a load of rubbish. And under cross-examination, her absolutely ludicrous story fell to pieces. But because the police won't press these women, because the police won't ask searching questions for fear of being hauled up by the feminist lynch mob, this guy had his life ruined. And believe me, when you're accused of something big, the papers love to have it there, front page, bold headlines, as if you have done it. But when you are found not guilty, nine times out of 10, it's a footnote on page 38, and no one sees it. So everyone's seen what you've been accused of, everyone thinks you've done it, but when you're found not guilty, that information just disappears. And those three things are typical. They're not everything that plays in women's favor. They're not everything that the feminists have done to men, but they are three very good examples of how men are now disadvantaged, both in terms of marriage, both in terms of divorce, in terms of seeing their children, and also in terms of serious allegations that may well be untrue. Definitely. That was a lot of a lot of truth there. And and this is the reason why I wanted traditional men to talk about this, because we get to say there is a problem, there is a system in place, policies in place put in by feminism, by feminists that are anti male and make it more difficult on the on the male, on the father, on the husband, and make men more afraid to enter into a relationship or marriage but then we get to turn around and we say what is the solution what is the traditional traditionalist solution so we have and that's kind of a general question that i have for you but also a uh, question from claire call she says would you repeal no fault divorce and she also wants to know your view on sex before marriage. She wants to know my view on sex before marriage as well. And I'll just give it real quick before I hand it to you. Um, I am a Christian, so it does say in my religious text that it is against my religion. Um, although you know, sin is sin, and we were, you know, just talking yesterday on this week on the All Right, everybody, you know. Everybody has a past, and um, so in the Christian context, sin is sin. You can be forgiven, but definitely I do not believe in sex before marriage. So uh, the <laughs> going back to what is the solution to this, this anti-male system that we have? What policies would you repeal? What is your future traditionalist utopia? Um, no fault divorce. Go. No fault divorce. I've already said what I'd do with divorce. I'd make divorce much harder to come by. It would only be granted in very special circumstances where there was either threat to either partner, threat to the children, or a serious degradation of a partner's behavior. Drug abuse, gambling, alcoholism, something that put the family at risk or the continuation, the continued well-being of the children or the other partner at risk, there would have to be a serious issue. These quickie divorces over silly issues, over the fact somebody's just changed their mind or they're having an off day or there's been a bit of an argument, we'd put an end to that. Um, of course we would, because we want to enshrine the importance of the family, but also we want to put people off getting married if they're not getting married for the right reasons. And that is very important. There are a lot of people today who think marriage is a joke. You know, they quite like a girl, all their friends are getting married. You know, they've seen, you know, weddings on the TV and they look like a laugh. And they go and do these things. They have this big, wonderful day. And it's like a massive day for show, like it's some big event for the social networks. And marriage is a very serious commitment and you should take it seriously. And divorce should not be granted easily and people should be essentially made to try and make that marriage work, to try and honor that commitment, because those vows should not be taken lightly. Thank you so much. And I guess the next 
question from the chat is are nationalists less marriageable i didn't i didn't know that was a word learned something new than non-nationalist i i've never heard that i i don't think i've ever even considered that as as something that could be an issue um are nationalists less marriageable coming from uh claire call i i believe as well yes claire i knew she'd be in the chat tonight well are our nationalists less uh, marriageable well in some ways yes and in some ways no we are less marriageable to women who think that the approval of the liberal establishment is important we are less marriageable to women who think that going out and drinking their weight in prosecco then puking up at the corner of the kebab shop before dragging themselves home at 6 a.m in the morning is the way to be and in that case yes and also nationalism is a very masculine movement we talk a lot about politics women aren't involved in politics especially not nationalist politics to the same degree so that can be off-putting now in other ways though we are in fact more marriageable because we are one of the few groups of men who still believe in traditionalism so traditional women who are looking for a traditional man who are looking for a protector and provider can come to nationalist groups and they will find that they will find a strong traditional group of alpha males who want to protect who want to preserve want to provide and want to raise a family so there are fours and against really for marrying nationalist men but for nationalist men who want a dating tip do not go out there and look for an alt-right woman if you are a strong man you will make your woman alt-right now every man that i know who is happily married or most of them i can think of one of my friends who's in a lasting relationship who actually met his partner through politics all of my other friends and all of my friends are political none of my friends are sort of normies um i just don't really like being around normies that much because there's only so much x factor in football i can talk about before my brain starts to rebel and makes Same. me leave. <laughs> so I, I find that all my men all, all the men around me who are deeply red pilled they found bar this one guy they found women and they red pilled their women and i out of all of the women i've had i've only ever had a couple who were from the movement very few all of my long-term girlfriends barring as i said barring one and I've, as i said i've had two girlfriends who've been in the movement only one of those were long term but all the other women that i've had and people who know me they know that i'm you know usually have someone on my arm especially at events and things like that I've never had a problem with getting a woman and getting a very attractive woman and red pilling them. In fact, if you are assertive, if you have a, a good personality, women tend to fall in line with what you believe very, very quickly. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a little bit of an attack here at the Soy Boys. You know these male feminists? You know these guys that think they'll appeal to women by groveling, they appeal to women by trying to adopt these kind of feminist nonsenses. So they'll be like, oh, a man should never mansplain. Hell, I love a bit of mansplaining. And I'll tell you something, if you go on a date with a woman and you actually tell her that she's wrong about something and you successfully explain something to her, she will love you for the rest of the night. She'll be hanging on your every word if she's a good woman. Because generally, after 40, 50,000 years of selective breeding and evolution, there is something deep-seated in white women's DNA that they like a strong alpha male. They like a man who can take control. Why do all the pretty girls get the choice of the men who are in the football team or the men who are in the rugby team or later in life, the men who have got the money. It's because they're going for an alpha male who can ultimately control them. And these weak, pathetic, low life, low status, bearded, wimpy, string bean, hipster jean wearing, male feminist cucks 
You know the reason why they never get what they want, why they never get in bed with all those women that they spend their time virtue signaling to, why they never ever get to spend the night with that girl who they've been saying everything that he thinks she wants to hear, because that's not what she wants to hear. Ultimately, she might be talking the feminist rubbish, but at the end of the day, she wants a big strong man to come and say, I've had enough of this nonsense. Get yourself upstairs now, love, because we're having a good night. And that's what women like. Women don't want a man who's creeping around them, asking for permission, who wants them to write a permission slip beforehand, penned in feminist pink ink to say that the sexual liaison is all above board and he's agreed upon beforehand. That kind of nonsense. Women don't want that. They want to be swept off their feet. They want a bit of strength. They want a guy who is firm, who is forthright, who knows what he's doing. That's what women want. And I can tell you, even when I've encountered women who have told me I'm wrong and who have told me that they're feminists, I have often appealed to them, not by backing down, but by literally rebutting what they've said and ultimately being the opposite of, the, of what they claim they want. But really, deep down, men who are strong alpha males who reject feminism are what women do want. And there's a certain actress, and I forget her name now. It might be Emma Watson. She played somebody in the Harry Potter films. She was, and she's a sort of a known feminist. And is it Emma Watson? Yeah, that's Emma Watson. Yeah. And she was going on about how men need to be and how women should pick a certain type of men. And I believe she was going out with some giant strapping rugby player. So even these celebrity feminists who talk this rubbish about what a man should be, even they do the opposite. And they do the opposite because they're hardwired to do that. And the women who follow the feminist nonsense through to its illogical conclusion are the ones who are the most unhappy because no soy boy ever satisfied any real woman. And I can assure you of that. Well, as a woman, I can affirm without giving out too much information about my own relationship, but uh, definitely dominance, men, dominance. That's the traditional, that is part of the traditional male sphere and uh, some um, somebody in the chat. We were kind. We were talking about the solution to some of these feminist policies and and this feminist society that that we are under. And I I want to go back just quickly to what does the our traditional utopia society future, past, present, what is the solution? Um, do we do we keep bringing up these policies and repealing them and rolling them back? Uh, would you add more policies in order to bring men up in law? Uh, what, what is the traditional solution? Also, Wolf, uh, what, I just lost the name, Wolf Mountain, I can get his name here in a minute. Well, he asked, uh, what if what if people, what if a man and a woman went into a marriage without any legal contract whatsoever, uh, that they were just in union? Uh, would you be in favor of that? So those two things. So firstly, um, what does our perfect society look like and how do we achieve that? Well, I think we do need to actually do something which will shock people. I've said this before about the way we treat immigrants. You see, women are now given the leg up. Women are actually given a better or higher status level than men. They are believed instantly in cases of rape. They are given the, um, basically, the, the thick end of the wedge when it comes to the sharing of um, rights with children, with looking after children, with seeing children if there is a divorce. And of course, a divorce courts absolutely favor women. So what we have to do is actually do what the feminists have been saying 
that they want to do, which is equality. We have to give people equality. And everything I've said so far tonight is actually fair. If we had divorce courts which said, you take with you what you came into the marriage with, plus half of what was made after the union, that is completely fair. Now, if some absolute uh, gold digger gets married to a, you know, some 22-year-old goddess meet some 45-year-old businessman. And this 45-year-old businessman has got 35 million in the bank. And this 22-year-old, she plays everything right. She says all the right things. She does all the right things. She blows his mind and she seems perfect. And the two get married. She should not be able to divorce him six months later and take half of what he's got. If she comes into it with nothing, she should take away nothing plus half of what was made in the six months when they were married. She should not be taking half of what he made and what he built before he even met her. That is absolutely absurd. And the reason I say it should be half of what is made when the couple are a whole is very important. And that's because I believe men achieve far more when they have a strong, loving partner in the home. And I am not discounting the role of women or diminishing the role of women. I know that my dad would not have been so successful as a businessman if he didn't have my mum cooking his tea, doing the washing, looking after the children and running a lovely home. So when he came home, he could relax. When he came home, he could do things with his family. And so he could focus more efficiently on his work. And you talked earlier about your husband and his commitment to his work. He could not commit himself to work like that if you weren't supporting him. So that is why I say that the partner should split equally what is made after the union but neither should take anything of what the other had before. And that would prevent these quickie divorces, these gold diggers, and these women who think they could marry a rich man and just rinse him. It would completely prevent that from happening. If we had equality in parental privilege, that would be absolutely fantastic because then women wouldn't be able to get a divorce and use the children as a weapon against the man. In fact, if the man is going to face severe censure or even criminal prosecution or any form of state prosecution for not meeting his obligations to the children, the woman should also. And that way it is fair. So what we're going to do is give people proper equality, like we should give people proper equality with university spaces. If blacks want to go to university, wonderful, but they shouldn't get automatic spaces at the, uh, you know, the expense of white students. It should be the best that go. It should be an equal footing. But none of this liberal garbage is ever about equality. It is about disenfranchising whites and destroying the traditional family. And that is why people are not given equality, but different groups are given superiority, which is used to either affect whites in a negative way or destroy and undermine the family unit. And I think if we followed those rulings, we would soon get to a situation where, as I said, with divorce laws changing and being tweaked and being made more traditional, with marriage being made only attractive if you were taking it seriously and never being a situation whereby people could get rich quickly by being gold diggers or skanks, I think the world would be a better place pretty much overnight. And also, we need to change the way we approach things like hookup culture, like dating, and we need to change things like social networks and the way people play out their relationships on those social networks. So instead of people looking at marriage as if it's some kind of Kanye West and Kim Kardashian soap opera, they look at marriage for what it truly is, a binding of two people who are spiritually, physically, and mentally compatible for the rest of their lives with the goal of starting a family and bringing up children. So what we need to do is, yes, reform the law. We need genuine, safe, and measured equality so that 
people are not being disenfranchised and it is men who are being disenfranchised. And finally, we need to put the emphasis back on traditional values, traditionalism and spiritual and mental reasons for being together, not basing our lives on some kind of false soap operas that play out on Facebook. Now, there are other things, of course, we need to do, but I can't talk about them all night. And if you want my opinion on these things, read my book. It's all in my book, but I cannot summarize a 300 page work in two hours. It, it's absolutely impossible. But I hope that I've given you some form of insight to things that we can start to do to start working on this. But we must always, and this is key, we must always put the whole of the family, the family as a whole, at the center of our society. And that family must always be a mother, a female, a father, a male, and the loving children. That must always be enshrined because it is the bedrock of our civilization. The loving mother, the strong disciplinarian, who is the father, and the obedient, kind, loving, and respectful children. That is what built Western civilization, or more accurately, it is what Western civilization was built upon. And we need to get back to that. And I've given you three ways we can, but we must always place that at the center of our society and our community. And sadly, we have placed other things, or women specifically have placed other things at the center of their world, such as careers. Um, and both men and women have placed promiscuity and trying to live as children or, or young adults up until they're in their sort of early 50s as a priority, rather than taking on the responsibilities that our parents and previous generations once did. Awesome. I, I think uh, it's interesting that you you take the uh, equality perspective, which obviously feminism isn't about equality and more equality in law should be in place, you know, for things to be more fair in family courts and and especially in divorce and domestic violence situations. We should we should always enter the, the system should always enter the situation in what are the facts, not by gender-based, you know, laws. So I, I was interested, though, when you talk about equality, there's so many different different aspects to, to what feminism has done and what it's done since the beginning with the vote and the vote being tied to uh, the draft for men and not for women. And then I talked about this uh, in, in the after party with Jason and Jared, uh, you know, can you draft pregnant women? You know, it would be equality to say, well, let's just uh, draft women so they can be able to vote. Or if we go to one house, one vote, or if we go to taking away the vote for women or, you know, uh, so is a total 100% equality in law possible? Or are we going to have to adopt some sort of balanced or complementary rights, kind of like a neo coverture as I was talking about with Jason and Jared and the, the after party? Well, I think some of this, and, and I don't mean this to be a, um, a flippant or evasive response to what you're saying, but at the moment, what we're doing as a movement is we are painting broad brush strokes because we're not in power. Now, Jared Taylor summed this up in the best way possible. Jared said when he was on my show that getting into minutia of exact tiny policy that we will enact is actually counterproductive because as a movement, before you get to power, you want to base your policies on broad brushstrokes, which are easy to understand. And the fine detail can be worked out later. But I think equality under the law is something that's important. And I think that one thing we do need to do with voting rights is certainly look at some form of not only one vote, one household, but it also needs to be some form of meritocracy. Because as you see in America, there are millions and millions of immigrants who have never done a thing for society coming in and without even any form of voter registration cards 
or proof of identity, people who have contributed nothing have the same vote as a family that's lived in the state for generations and has contributed, worked hard, been pillars of the community, but they are effectively equal. And I do believe we need to look at all of these things, but we need to be in a position to actually legislate and look at sort of facts, details, figures in very, very fine detail when we do that. So what I will say is I do think people need to be equal under the law, but you raise very good points about the draft. You raise very good points about women voting because one of the problems that we face, um, I'm going to be very, very honest about this, is men and women are very different. And I'm going to illustrate this in a very childlike way. When a child, and we've all been young, when you have something that you want to ask your parents for, or you want to do something that you think your parents might disagree with, who do you go to? Every child runs to their mum, and their mum is easily manipulated. They go to their mother because she is easier to deal with because she's more emotional and she can be turned. Now, they do not go to their father. I never went to my dad and asked her difficult things or asked for difficult things because he would always just say no. And if I was asking for something that my mother didn't really want to um, give in on, she'd always say, you need to ask your dad about this. And essentially what I'm saying is, because women are more emotional, because women, and that's natural, and it's good, and it's right, because they have to be, because they're bringing up children. But because women are more emotional, they can be manipulated far more easily when it comes to matters of the heart or matters that play on the heartstrings. And that is why women are often far, far more willing to vote for open borders, to vote for rights for refugees, to be accepting, because the way the media plays on their heartstrings is very much something that has been planned. It's something that the media knows how to do. The media pick on women because they know they are the easy way to push through liberal policy. And that's just a fact. And also, that is now bolstered by the fact so many men are weak, soy-filled cooks who basically just acquiesce to these same things because they're useless, because they're weak, because they're also emotional, because they've never had strong male role models. So that's also another factor that occurs now. So yes, we do need to take stock of the fact that women are more emotional. And once they are sort of completely, for want of a better phrase, let off the leash, they can often do great damage to society through their natural levels of empathy and care, which unfortunately are no longer aimed at their own people, but are aimed at a group of alien invaders. And when I say aliens, I mean illegal aliens, not the type that come down in little flying saucers, uh, who are coming here and wreaking havoc. But they see a little boy washed up on a beach in Turkey. They see families being separated by ice and it pulls on their heartstrings. And that is not something that's unnatural. It is natural for women to think that way. They are the primary caregiver for babies and toddlers. They are meant to be more empathetic. They are meant to be more emotional. That is their role. That is their half of the complementary pair that is the male and female partnership. But our enemies understand that. They have a deep understanding of the psychology of men and women, and they are using the psychology against us. But we must also play on that. We must also play on that. And here's just one small thing to wrap this up very quickly. When we in the BMP were at the height of our success, we actually had a huge number of female voters because we used female empathy and care for children to sell our policies. We said to them, look at all these young white girls who have been betrayed. It could be your daughter. It could be your children. Think of how terrible it is to be targeted by one of these grooming gangs. And all of a sudden, using those emotional tactics, dropping facts, figures and statistics 
or wrapping facts, figures and statistics up with emotion in that way, sold us to the public, got voters to vote for us on an emotional ticket. And nationalism or patriotism or traditionalism must be wrapped up in emotion if we want to sell it to women. Like I said earlier, we need a wave of trad women who are making Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts that make staying at home, baking, cooking, and looking after the kids out to be the fulfilling tasks they are. The trad women need to be showing the world how happy they are to counter the false happiness, the poison that is the idea of going out, getting drunk, and living a promiscuous and hedonistic life, because we all know that doesn't lead to happiness in the long run. We have to use the female emotion. We have to use the fact females are more emotional, and we have to understand that, and we have to tailor our message so we can attract females into the movement, and so that at the current time, women can vote. And we are not changing that until we get to power. So we have to accept that. And rather than sitting and complaining about that, we have to find a way to make women vote for us and come to us. And the only way we can do that is if we adopt an emotional message that is tailored to women. So I hope that's a, a concise answer as I can give on that one. Definitely. I love it. I, I love the, the way that you explain the natural biological process of the the nurturing the emotional and i do believe it's biological uh for women to care more about um social issues and and nurturing and and that's why you you see them voting uh their their top priorities are education and and taking care of the children and and it's very innate and it's very biological for women to want to you know take care of their children so they want to take care of other people's children so they want to take care of the other country's children and and this is uh this has been a problem with with the female vote and it has been a a criticism of the female vote but i i respect definitely that that we are we're not at a point yet that we can say this is the solution and uh this will is this what's going to happen in our future utopia because like like we you said uh you know it, it is in the future and it is a utopia so um when when uh somebody in the chat hallucinating heads said um that he he or she i think it's a he wish that i did not um use my religion as a answer for the sex before marriage question but uh and ask for a more detailed answer but this is about mark and the traditional male so i will probably make a video about that but thank you thank you for the interest in Can I throw something in on the sex before marriage no this is you not your video to... you don't want no, me to okay. talk about sex no. before... <laughs> what are you are you telling me what to do, woman? <laughs> you can oh, go. No. Well, I think sex before marriage is a very interesting thing, and I'm not particularly against sex before marriage because I think it's important to know if you are sexually compatible with your partner. However, that is not a excuse for promiscuity. It's not an excuse for running about and having sex with every woman you meet. So. Yes, obviously I've had sex before marriage and I would recommend if you are in a serious relationship, you do have sex before you get married, you make sure you're compatible in the bedroom. However, don't be promiscuous. Now, there's something very interesting about this that I just wanted to touch upon. Men and women are very different sexually. And the way I mean that is, generally speaking, 90% of women are not sexually driven and 10% are. 10%, you know, they want sex all the time, but 90% of women are quite good at holding off. Whereas with men, it's the other way around. 90% of men are, yes, 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 I want it now, I want it now. And 10% are a bit more sort of like low T, they're low testosterone, they don't want, they don't want the sex. You know? So generally speaking, men are chasing and women are sort of saying, I, I can live without it, maybe, maybe. And that's actually, 
natural. That's nature's design. You see, if everyone didn't really want sex, if everyone didn't really want sex, we'd never reproduce and we'd die out. And if everyone wanted sex like all the time, equally society would completely fail, just com completely fall to pieces because you'd go out on a summer's day and you know men would be like, wow, she looks great in that dress. And the woman would be like, well, I'm in this dress. If you want to come and have a piece of me, come and grab it. And the people would just be having sex in the street. And that would be like Sodom and Gomorrah. It would be absolute disaster. So women play the role of being the gatekeeper. And the man, and you see this in many different species, the man plays the role of wanting the sex desperately, but trying to impress the woman so that she gives it to him. So the man is like, give me, give me, give me. And the woman's like, maybe, I'm thinking about it. So the idea of promiscuity dies at that point because the woman says, you know what? I'll give you it if you are a decent person, if you are a provider, and if you only do it with me. So in the same way that sort of stags or peacocks will do certain struts or dances or even fight each other to impress the female, the male does things to impress the female. And she then grants him the right of passage. She, she then grants him a sexual relationship, but usually on the grounds that it is monogamous and marriage is very much the ratification of that deal, that the woman has granted the man the right to the sex he desires. The woman has, who is the gatekeeper has, for want of a better terms, opened the gate, but only to him and on the proviso that that is the only gate that he seeks to pass through. And that is how a society regulates itself. And that is why women are sort of less up for sex before marriage and men are much, much more chasing it because men are driven by testosterone, which drives them to have a higher sex drive than most women. And that's why when you do meet women who have this incredible sex drive and sleep around a lot, they can often have more masculine tendencies. They are like these ladettes or these people who drink, you know, often you say, wow, she sleeps around a lot, but she acts a bit like a fella, you know, she drinks her weight in beer before she does. And essentially, feminine females grant sex to men on the proviso that they only have sex with them, which in a way is almost like a marital contract before you are even married. I hope that makes sense. That makes sense, definitely. And thank you for your answer on that. And let's uh, switch to hypergamy. Now, this has been a topic that has been discussed recently. And I have given my two cents on how I feel. You know, it's a natural biological survivalist response of women, but definitely has been taken advantage of and definitely under feminist uh, society, feminist policies, gynocentric culture, it can definitely be a detriment rather than something that is good and natural for the survival of women seeking for men to protect and provide for them for the sake of the survival of the family and civilization. Uh, but thoughts on hypergamy, what are your thoughts? Well, basically, is it natural for women to seek men of a higher status to protect and provide? Yes, of course it is. Women and men look for very different things in a relationship. And men are at their highest market value when they're a little bit older, when they're in their mid thirties, up to maybe their early early 50s. That's when men kind of peak. That's when they're at their highest market value because it's when they have their highest status in society. It's when they earn the most. It's when they're the most powerful and it's when they're the most knowledgeable. It's when they're settled into their role and it's when they can be a good father, a teacher, a provider, a disciplinarian. Young men or younger men are not very attractive, generally speaking, to females. Females usually choose older men. And equally, when is a woman at her highest status? Well, women are high status when they are younger, when they are firmer, when they have better bodies, when they are prettier, when they are at their peak of beauty 
and most physically attractive so that men want to look after them. Men want to provide with them, for them and men want to procreate with them. So the woman is looking for a protector, a provider, almost in some ways a replacement for her father because when fathers used to give away their daughters, the idea of giving away your daughter at the altar is that you are passing on your duty as a father, as a protector and a provider to another man. That is why you give your daughter away. You put her in the care of a man that you trust to marry her, look after her and provide for her until the day she dies. So a woman is high value when she is young, beautiful, attractive and at the peak of her childbearing age. A man is at his highest value when he is richer, more worldly wise, and has more stability in his life. So it is not uncommon for an older man to date a younger or even much younger woman. Now, it is natural, as I said, for a woman to seek out a higher status man. That is just natural. And it is natural for the most beautiful women to get the most high status men, because the high status men are looking for a high status woman. And as I said, high status women are seen as ones who are youthful, beautiful, and in great physical shape. Because a man looks at that and he not only wants to protect, provide for, nurture, and love someone like that, but he looks at that and thinks, you're going to be a great vessel for children. Your genetics are fantastic, and I want to have babies with you. So that's all natural. Now, what is unnatural and what the feminists have done is they have extended this to trading up. Now, when a woman looked for a high status man, she would then stick by him. She would then be his loyal wife through the good and the bad, through sickness and health, through the ups and the downs. And if things were going well, she would love him and support him and stay at his side. And if things took a turn for the worst, she would still love him and support him and stay at his side. So when she had made her choice and when he had made his choice and they'd come together, they would stay together. The problem you have today is you have all of these relationship advisors and sexperts, as they call themselves. And these people are often from a certain tribe that seem to have some hugely negative effect on Western civilization. And they tell people, especially young women, not to just pick a high status man that's natural, but to pick a high status man. But if a better one comes along, trade up. So picking a high status man, totally natural. In the same way for a man, it's natural to pick a beautiful younger woman. But then to trade up and to discard your partner for a better model, that is what is unnatural. Equally, it is unnatural for these men. And you see them all the time, these powerful businessmen. They marry a woman who's maybe 10, 20 years his junior. They have a few children. And then 20 years on, when he's 60 and she's 40, and usually these women are still stunning, especially for their age. You know, they look fantastic because they you know, had all the money spent on them and they, they look great. He then decides at 60 that he wants a 25-year-old. So he bins his wife. And that's equally wrong. So the problem here isn't people going for high status partners. It's finding high status partners and then thinking that it's like a trading card game where you can just trade up constantly and break your marital vows, split apart the family like it's all a game. It's not. Pick somebody who is high status. That is natural. If you are a 10 out of 10 good looking guy, in his mid to late 30s with a six-figure income, take my advice. Use that status and find yourself an absolute stunner who wants to be the perfect little housewife. Equally, if you are an absolute little stunner who wants to be a perfect housewife, pick that guy in his mid to late 30s who's got a six-figure income and can look after you and your children. Those are natural choices but neither of the couple in that partnership should then seek to trade up. The whole point of monogamy is once you've made your choice, once you've picked the perfect man, you stick with that choice. It isn't a game of stick or twist. It's not a game where you get keep getting more and more cards and hoping for the ace to pop up. 
You make your choice and you stick with it. Because if you don't, you are ripping apart families. You are destroying the chance that your children have for a proper upbringing. And you are destroying the fundamental fabric of our society. Definitely. I would agree with everything that you just said there. And if I seem a little rude because my eye contact is weird, my camera is right in the middle. I've got a computer right here with with us and I can see you and then I can see the chat on the second computer. <laughs> so I'm trying my best to be respectful and remember to keep looking back and uh, but I'm trying to look at the chat at the same time and then I've got uh, so technology. I understand, right? I understand completely because when I do this week on the old right, my eyes must be flying all over the place as if I've got sort of a, you know, a swarm of wasps hovering around the computer. But I'm usually looking at the sort of the private chat between the group, the group chat for the audience. And on top of that, there's usually a couple of people messaging me on Skype or Discord telling me how what I should bring up on the show. So I understand how manic it can be. Right. And my husband has two computers so i i took advantage of that and i put one one's the chat and one's our discussion so i can actually look at the chat because before it's it's not it's not, it's not that easy i'm trying here but um no i i think that my relationship with my husband from the beginning was uh kind of just what what you described a very natural uh hypergamous, hy hypergamous. I have a difficult time with that word, but a uh, kind of relationship. And he's a little bit older than me and he did have a, a little bit more experience and, and was able to protect and provide. And, and I did want to be traditional and I did want to stay at home. So uh, that's not always a bad thing. Thing is is for women to to look into being uh, pr protected and provided for. Um, I think it is very natural and biological, definitely under sexual liberation. And if you're you're um, embracing sexual liberation, that it well that in itself is just a terrible idea all altogether. So definitely one hundred percent agree. So. Let's talk a, a little bit about the the other side of the anti-feminist. Um, you have your your egalitarians, the ones who are saying um, they may be non-gender role or they may be anti-gender role, and I've encountered both. And and it, some people say, well, for your own family, you know, do whatever you want to do. Um, if the man wants to stay at home, if the woman wants to have the high powered career. Um, but then you also have your anti gender role that it's, you know, absolutely no gender roles because it's oppressive towards both, both uh, sexes at the same time. So you kind of have both type of people in this big umbrella of, uh, what we, we would call egalitarians. Although if you ask a hundred different people what egalitarianism means, then you'll get a hundred different answers I've found. So can you give a an explanation of maybe how important traditionalism to, is to you? Or is there room for outliers as far as gender roles? Not really. Look, I mean, that's just a load of rubbish, isn't it? You know, these people, like, there's no gender roles. Of course there is. Of course there is. If the man in the house is not the head of the house, if he doesn't have, for want of the better word, the testicles, then he's not really a man, is he? Let's face it. If the man hasn't got control, it's a really bad showing. I mean, if I... Um, was in a serious relationship where a woman was telling me what I could and couldn't do. And my children came to me as the pushover because she was the disciplinarian in the house. That would really paint me out to be an utter, utter beta male. Now, the fact of the matter is children need healthy gender roles. Young men need to go out there and they need to be 
boys that look up to men and want to do manly things. When I was a young boy, I was out on my bike, I was climbing trees, I was building tree houses, building rope swings, and I would often come home with my knees cut up, covered in mud, covered in nettle stings, literally worn out, you know, and you got in and your mum would be like, you get up there and get straight in that bath, mister. You are an absolute mess. And my sister would be at home and she would be playing with the doll's house. She would be um, pushing around a pram with a little doll in it. She would be baking with my mum. Her friends and her would be making like a little stall where they sold the cakes or did things like that. And those things are important. Gender roles are natural, they are healthy, and they should be reinforced. Once you don't reinforce gender roles, once you push this absolute rubbish upon um, society, all you end up doing is almost like trying to swim upstream. You are going against the current. It is unnatural. It is hard work. And you are turning nature completely on its head. And then you get a huge amount of depressed, mixed up people who often do things like self-harm. And we're seeing a huge rise in young females who are self-harming. It's absolutely now an epidemic here in the UK. I posted something about this on my um, Twitter the other day, and it wasn't one of the items that was taken up to a large degree by the people who follow me, because generally people look for things on immigration, on Islam, on terror, and on the, uh, the good old JQ. But this was something that was largely sort of washed over. But one of these things that you tend to find in a society is when you break down natural and healthy roles, because people still have an inbuilt yearning for those things. But when you push people in the opposite direction to what to where they want to go, when you have people swimming against the current, it is very depressing. It is very disconcerting for those people. And young boys, they need their dad. They need to want to be little warriors. And young girls, they need their mum. They need to be little homemakers, little, you know, want to be little mothers themselves. Uh, a couple of my friends have got children. And uh, it's very heartening to see. They've just had a new baby. Here. I'm, I'm the godfather to that uh, little boy. And his sister, who's a little bit older, she absolutely loves pushing the little boy in the push chair. She always, mum, mum, I want to push, I want to push, because her natural gender role of being motherly, of looking after her little brother, is already showing through. She is already exhibiting that, and that is completely natural. And this gender neutral environment is literally, as I said, like trying to force people to swim upstream. It is unnatural, and it leads to a deep-seated depression and sense of disconnection with your natural yearnings and the natural world. So yeah, people who are bringing their kids up in these kind of almost science experiments, it almost makes the home like a giant Petri dish. You know, shall we bring our kids up in this unnatural, weird environment to see how they turn out? Well, yeah, don't be surprised when your kid turns out to be an absolute freak and weirdo. You know, and we are seeing these freaks and weirdos. We're seeing these little boys who are celebrated for wanting to open drag clubs. You know what? If your boy grows up like that, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be utterly ashamed of yourselves as parents. You know, that is not natural. It's not good. And that boy needs serious counseling. He needs serious help. And if you look at him, he also looks, the boy I'm talking about also looks very physically ill as well. He doesn't look healthy. He doesn't look like a little boy should look. He does not look full of life. And this is a major, major problem because increasingly these leftist freaks, these liberals are teaching their kids, treating their kids, sorry, like science experiments. Let's see what happens if we break down all natural barriers and try to get our boys to be like little girls. That, I'm afraid, is child abuse. And that is why I wanted to open up this discussion to traditional men, because we get, like I said at the beginning of the show, we're going to get the raw real truth of what what traditional men feel and and how they talk and what they say to each other when when their voices are not being drowned out by uh, other movements so I, I really appreciate that and I can say that my husband has said very much the same thing so we have a uh, C maiden who says uh, this is this is a uh, 
maybe a little bit of a curveball with the the topic that we're talking about right now, but she has a specific question. What do you think of people being nationalists but not letting go of their degenerate ways? Well, I'm pleased to me that's that question because we um, I've discussed this several times on This Week on the Alt-Right, and this is very important. And obviously people who were watching the show last night will probably know what this is aimed at. Well, I believe, I, I believe that C Maiden is referring to the guest I had last night on This Week on the Alt-Right. Now, I believe that our society has been twisted, but it's not just been twisted, it's been twisted so far that it is now in many ways fundamentally broken. Our society is no longer what it once was. Our society is something now which is a twisted, broken mockery of what it once was. And this sickness is pervasive and it has infected and infested almost every facet and institution within our society. So for anyone to say that they have not been affected or touched in any way by the degeneracy or by the sickness is a lie. It's a lie. Everyone has in some way. Now, I know people who have smoked weed. The guest I had last night on my show had previously been involved in pornography. I know people who have been heavily into the hedonistic club scene where they have taken drugs, where they have drank excessively, whether they, where they have pursued hedonism and promiscuity. I have known people who have been involved in a sick cycle of materialism where all they think about is more and more money, where all they think about is gambling or spending so much they're instantly in debt. I know people who've been addicted to body modification, who have been addicted to becoming the ultimate individual, so they stand out completely. I know people that have been affected in many ways, people who have been addicted to computer games and sit up all night like some nocturnal weirdo playing endless rounds of Counter-Strike because they haven't got a functioning superego that can say no. I know people that have been addicted to food, that have become obese, slobbish, and useless, and can't even perform physically in any normal way, because our enemies have got something going for them. And that's that all the sicknesses that they have foisted upon our society are sicknesses that please us in some way, Food, sex, porn, drugs, alcohol, gambling, materialism, hedonism, partying, promiscuity. All of these things play to our base pleasure principle. And we have had our morality stripped away from us. So increasingly, people give in to these hedonistic, materialistic, and base desires, which all see us sliding into this pit of abject degeneracy. Now, the light at the end of the tunnel, the light at the top of the well or the pit that we've fallen into is nationalism. It is traditionalism. It is morality. It is the European culture, heritage, and ways of life that have stood us in good stead for thousands, nay, tens of thousands of years and have stood our ancestors in good stead. That, my friends, is what we need to recapture. But in recapturing that, many of us will have regrets. Many of us will have our lives tainted by degeneracy. Many of us will have had too many sexual partners. We will have dabbled with drugs. I've never been affected by drugs. That's something I totally never appealed to me. I've never smoked. I've never taken drugs. But I have chased the wrong type of women. That's always been a weakness for me. Probably the reason why I'm not married now. But we have all been essentially touched by the particular degenerate streak which affects us the most. That's our weakness. But the important thing is, as we mature, as we embrace 
nationalism, as we embrace traditionalism, we must leave those degenerate callings at the door. And we must be a movement of forgiveness. We must be a movement that says, you know what? You've made mistakes, but we all have. But as long as we leave those mistakes at the door, as long as we condemn our past actions, we must move forward as a group. And we must be basically forgiving enough to say, yeah, everyone has done stupid things before they saw the light. Because unfortunately, we are going to see more and more. Well, it's not unfortunate. It is fortunate that we are going to see more and more people, especially young people, turning to our cause. But the unfortunate thing is so many of them will be tainted in some way by this disgusting, pervasive, degenerate, anti-white system in which we live. But we have to be welcoming to these people. We have to help them beat their addictions. We have to help them overcome their failings. We have to help them become better people. And part of that is being big enough to forgive these people and say to them, yes, you have a place in our movement. Yes, there is a better way. And yes, it doesn't matter. You may have done foolish things, but we understand. And we understand that you did those foolish things because you were lied to. You were lied to by a group of horrible, insidious, vindictive internationalists whose goal is to break our civilization and to erase our race. And we understand that the way to combat those people, the way to defeat our enemies is to hold out our hand to our lost brothers and sisters and take those people into our circle and give them the traditional life that will heal their wounds, that will heal their souls and make them feel better as people. It will make them feel complete. And to take it back to the issue of self-harm, to the issue of so many whites being lost and depressed and crushed and feeling like they don't have a place in the world, we will show these people that they do have a place, that there is happiness, that there is a better way, that there is a brighter future. And that brighter future is a white society. It is an ethno state that prides itself on traditionalism and holds up our culture, our ways of life and our heritage as something that can be celebrated. And most of all, it is a place where white people can be proud of their history, their ancestry, and where white people have a right to exist. Amazing. I love your rants. That's why I wanted you on here first, because I knew I would I would have to do less talking and you would just go on these epic rants that you're known for. So I definitely, um, you know, I just briefly before we jump into a couple more questions, we're running low on time and I've got to get back to my little civilization builders over there. But uh, I, when I was actually interviewed by a reporter who's who's working on um, a big project and and researching domesticity and the feminist opposition to domesticity and she asked me you know you see people in the movement kind of coming from the left and then they go to the right or you see that they have a past and and she knew enough about me that I got married at 19 um, you know, I was, I, I actually kind of went through an old fashioned courtship. My, my husband is the first one, uh, that I actually ever dated. Um, and we knew each other for a long time. So you could say that because I found motherhood and marriage at such a young age, there's not really much there in the past. Uh, but when I got married and I didn't know how to deal with that because I did come from a, a, you know, I came from divorced parents and I came from a mother who didn't really want to be a mother. So it took me a long time 
a little while, you know, to figure out the mother thing and the marriage thing and and how to do it correctly. And my heart was always in the right place, but I, I've made mistakes in the past and and I've been open about uh, part of that coping mechanism of not knowing how to be a mother because I wasn't raised by somebody who wanted to be a mother was a past eating disorder. And something like that takes away from your family and your home uh, just as much if it was something else. And, and I think that that has value. And I think that um, people, you know, will, will say things, you know, that, uh, you know, little miss perfect, but definitely if you've walked through my shoes over what it took for me to learn how to be a wife and mother and thank God for my mother-in-law, she, she stepped in and she really showed me how to be a wife and mother. And it was, it, I mean, God knew what he was doing and I really appreciate her guidance and, and his guidance. But um, there, there's value in redemption and there's value in, and people who maybe did come to traditionalism at a young age. And what I told her was people who have came from the left and went to the right I don't think that I could have at that time had the strength to do that, to make that tr transition because of what I had been through in my childhood, the, the eating disorder, the anxiety, um, not knowing, you know, anything about life, uh, how to be a wife and mother. So I really respect people who have came from, you know, a past and, like you said, we'll leave it at the door when they find the light. And then now they're living traditionally because to be honest, I, I don't know if at that time I would have had the strength to, to make that transition. So I think God was looking out for me and, and putting me in the place that he put me in and, and the pe putting the people in my life that he put the people in my life. And so I'm very grateful for that. Um, but let's get back to some of the questions. Uh, question for Mark. Uh, Mark has just said that our senses have been used against us. Buddhism specifically deals with recognizing and controlling sensual desires. Could Buddhism be useful? Uh, I'm not really for foreign religions, so... Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't really have anything more to add than that. You know, I don't think, um, although we can learn things from other cultures and to some degree take inspiration from other cultures, at this time, we as a group need to be taking all of our inspiration from our ancestors and their great achievements. And we have such a rich and deep history, ultimately, that is where I take my inspiration from. And where I take my spiritual inspiration from is from the great men of the West who faced extreme adversity, who faced almost certain death and defeat, yet stared that death and defeat in the eye and said, I'm not moving. I'm standing here. I'm taking a stand, not just for me, not just for my wife, not just for my family, not just for my village, but for my entire culture and civilization. And you know what? They took that stand. And the reason we're here today is because they always overcame. And that's why I always have faith, because I believe we will too. I believe that we will not go quietly into the night, that we will overcome our enemies and we will rise up and we will reclaim what is rightfully ours definitely and there's so many questions um there there are a few questions that that unfortunately we are running out of time i want to close by asking you uh there are there are two things one uh what would be your advice for young traditional men and two what is the future for traditional men and the general 
role as traditional men play in society. Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Warren Farrell, but he talks a lot about fatherlessness homes, fatherlessness and, and how that affects society. So um, those two things, we can close it out. Advice for young traditional men and the future for the traditional male and how it affects marriage, family and society. Okay, firstly, advice. Number one, you want a good woman. You want a good woman and you want a good looking woman. You want an intelligent woman and you want a woman who's going to be loyal to you. Now, if you want those things, you have to be at first in love with yourself. You have to love yourself because if you don't love you, if you don't look at yourself in the mirror and think, wow, I'm a catch. No one else is going to look at you and think, God, he's a catch. You have to have high self-esteem and high self-esteem comes from success. So your first stage in achieving what you want is to be the best you can be. Go to the gym, go to the gym and train, train as hard as you can, eat well, lift heavy and run and cycle. Get yourself into great shape. Use your money, not on these e-beggars, not on endless computer games, not on cigarettes, not on drugs, not on alcohol, but use it on improving yourself. Use it to get yourself in the right headspace. Educate yourself, buy nice clothes, make sure you're well-groomed and make sure you are well-presented. And once you've done that, once you are in that position, you will be well equipped to look at yourself in the mirror and say, wow, which means other people will look at you and say, wow. And when women look at you and say, wow, they will want you. And if you are confident and you exude that confidence, which I'm talking about, people will be naturally attracted to you. People will be drawn to you because believe me, if you don't love yourself, no one else is going to love you. If you don't hold yourself in high esteem, no one else can. You can't go out there shuffling around, looking at the floor, feeling unconfident and conquer the world. Part of conquering the world comes from believing you can conquer the world. So get yourself into a position where you can respect and love yourself and you feel like a conqueror. Then you have to find a woman. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a, a shock to some people. I actually believe that dating sites are much better than walking into clubs and bars because you don't want to be meeting somebody who's half cut that you're going to roll into bed with, that's dancing to a load of raucous, often black music, who's smoking, drinking, probably high on drugs. Go on dating sites and be honest about yourself. Say, I'm into outdoor pursuits. I like mountain biking. I like hiking. I like going out for nice meals but I'm not a drinker. I'm not a smoker. I don't use drugs. And I'm looking for a proper serious relationship here. That will filter out the waste of times. Then filter the women that come to you. Filter the women that are interested in you and make sure they have a similar outlook on life. Be honest with them. I want a wife and children. That's what I'm looking for. I'm a traditionalist. And then Go out on some dates, meet these people, have fun with them and talk to them. And if they're suitable, if you find them attractive, if there's that spark, feed them the red pill and make them yours. That's the way to do it, guys. And I can't really say much more than that. And is there a healthy outlook for a traditionalist man? That's not for me to answer. That's for you to answer because the future your future as a traditionalist man is in your hands, just as mine is in my hands. Your future is what you make it. And if you follow those rules, if you go down that path of making yourself great, your life will be as great as you make yourself. Your future is what you make it. But one thing is for sure, sitting down on your bed late at night, playing endless rounds of Call of Duty and Counter-Strike, eating Doritos, drinking Mountain Dew, and feeling sorry for yourself and feeling black-pilled over the state of the world won't change the world and it won't help you. The first step to 
greatness and the first step to getting a girl and the first step ultimately to helping save our race is saving you. And it is you turning yourself into someone that is confident and can stand up there, attract women and be a pillar of our community. And if you do all that, the outlook for the traditionalist man is much better. You are helping us win the battle. And that's really all I can say on that. Definitely. Love it. Thank you so much. And I guess we'll close out here. Um, I, I guess I, I will tell you where you can find me if you haven't been to my channel before. Um, I here on the YouTube. And uh, <laughs> you can find her here. I can like, find you right you've here. Found her. It's like an episode of the A Team. Where, where can we find the A Team? You've already found them. That's I have no idea what the A-Team is. You've no, got, you've no idea what the A-Team is. <laughs> oh, A-Team. Yeah, um, I'm not old enough for that, but my husband is. Oh, my is. God, I'm showing my age now. <laughs> it's time I backed away very, very rapidly. No, my, actually, my husband is, is just a few years older than me, and he teases me teases me about it a lot. But, um, no, and, and I have a public Facebook group at Trad Lacey, and uh, I have an Instagram, Lacey Lauren Lynn. And I know there's a lot of Laurens. I can't change that. I'm sorry. And then at Twitter, Lacey Lynn. And basically, my content is just I really hate feminism. And uh, some nationalism, Trad Life stuff. Uh, I, I saw somebody in the chat saying that I should get a better camera <laughs> working on that. If you catch my last live, I am, I'm actually, our family is going through a lot of expenses right now in terms of travel. We're actually traveling. I've met two really wonderful ladies uh, who were internet friends that I now have a, met in person and I encourage safely for people to do that so we can, you know, rebuild our communities, make those connections, you know, in person. And then my best friend is getting married and I'm a bridesmaid. So uh, I'll be traveling for her wedding um, because she's going back to her home state. So I'm extremely excited for them. And they're just wonderful, wonderful people. And she's gonna wanna stay home and homeschool. So, I'll be able to teach her how to cook and and I've been working on that as well and you know teaching her about babies so I'm really excited about that but we have some expenses and travel coming up but new camera is on the list I promise okay I'll shut up now Mark <laughs> well thank you for having me on it's been a real pleasure obviously I support your work I always talk about you on this week on the alt right and I say to all men and all young women that the right kind of women to support are the ones who are living the trad life because these women need to be held up as inspiration or as an inspiration for young women and for young men as well. Thanks for having me on. It's been an absolutely wonderful night. And if people want to uh, hear more from me or want to learn more about me, you can follow me on Twitter and on Gab. You can also subscribe to me on YouTube. I really appreciate that. I put out a podcast every week and have a weekly show. And if you want to support my work, you can buy my book and you can also download it for free and send it out to friends and family and help spread the message. That is something that is always so important. I always put that first because this isn't about um, me. This is about spreading a message. This is about waking up our people and building a brighter future and ensuring that there is a future for white people. So thank you again. It's been a great night. And we had so many questions. I'm sure we have so much more to talk about. If you ever want me back on, I'd be more than happy to join you again. Oh, definitely. There's there's so much that we could talk about for, for hours. And I, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. I'm very interested in the male's perspective on uh, feminism, on our culture today, and the traditional males perspective the uh the the husbands of the women who are on youtube who can't speak on on youtube and the men who do go into the movement of the greater anti-feminist movement and are 
told that they're cucks for even wanting to be in a marriage. So I, it's been a huge on my heart, very heavy on my heart to um, ask these really tough questions and get these raw answers that that comes from my husband that I just want to put, <laughs> you know, um, and, and there's a little bit of difference too. And, you know, people, people can be different in, in how they give their answers, but the traditional male voice is definitely something that I feel has been lacking in the anti, uh, the, the greater anti-feminist movement. So I really appreciate you coming on and answering these questions and giving your perspective. So, um, thank you all for joining us and I appreciate it. And if I didn't get to your question, I'm so, so sorry, but I do have to go make sure my children are okay and not killing each other. <laughs> so see y'all later. Bye.